you all mind if I sit down? Is that going to bother anybody? You can do whatever. Standing up it, it, it makes it uh, can be difficult for me. I, I can't stand in one place. Mm -hmm. Do you all mind if I sit down? Is that going to bother anybody? That's just creepy. <laughs> <laughs> what do I need to do? Yeah, I'm going to can the other session is it coming for me yeah you want to turn off. i had him turn off his mic my mic is on it's mute too and my video is going to the volume is down it's off testing that would be a painful presentation, but just ten seconds away. Um, we're going to put this in. Extra pages. That might be it for now. Extra pages. That's the audio. Again, I can maybe take that out. That might be it for now. Yes. Let's see if that does it. But it's still doing Do you have a mic on? Yeah, I was going to say, how about the green part right up there? It says you're new. This one right here? Oh, all the way up. Even oh, high. See the group viewing? All the way up the top? Oh, here? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's, the sound is off, the mute is off, or the mute is on, the video is muted. See if that works. Is that better? I think it is. You hear that? I think we're okay. Was it you or me? <laughs> you just run with whatever works, right? It doesn't matter. All right, thank you all for, for being patient. I apologize. Um, can I, I hope everybody online can hear me okay too. We're just kind of sharing the screen at this point and we're just gonna roll with what we've got and see see how this works. It sounds like it's picking up a little bit of sound, but I'll move from here. It's probably going to start being bad again because it's went to Mac, uh, the pro uh, microphone. Let's see what happens. Okay, we're just going to keep on talking. And if it starts flaring, I apologize. Uh, so the reason why this, I'm going to stand over here just in case. So the, you're okay? All right, so the, the reason why I, I started on this journey is at last year I, at the FISTA conference when we went virtual because of the pandemic, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm vaccinated, fully vaccinated. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to stay way back here, <laughs> socially distanced. I have no, no uh, particular issues. So the reason why I started on this journey is because my, my doctorate's in ed tech and my, uh, my master's degree is in special ed, and I really became interested in this. There's a, we, whenever we talk about technology and we start talking about disability, we almost always go the route of assistive technology, and that's the problem with it is that we just automatically shift that. Now, system tech is a, a particular um, focus of, of special education, but it doesn't have to be the only one when we talk about technology. This is a little distracting. I'm, I'm gonna get this going. Is this okay? Is this 
So are we okay? All right. So I, I'm just going to keep talking. I, I apologize. So um, one of the the the, um, the reason why I started becoming interested in this because I kept on seeing problems where we had individuals who uh, were having to take their classes online during the pandemic. A lot of our special ed folks had to go online suddenly, and then we had to deal with that, and it was problematic. So here's the question. Uh, Background-wise, there's only five of you in here, so we're just going to do that with the five. What is it that, uh, where's your what's your background? Why are you here? What's the, where are you coming from? Administration, general ed, tech, higher ed, where, where's it coming from? So, uh, I'm an instructional technology coach, and I... Um serve early childhood yeah. and that also includes um, exceptional preschoolers uh, that have um, definitely like developmental delays and, and special needs and I really want to support those teachers in utilizing technology not just as something that's adaptive for their needs but something that can enhance the learning that they're doing. Yeah preschool is tough in, in this realm because we're talking about kids at a very young age starting to use that so that, that can be a little bit harder um, but yeah we can I mean what a lot of this session is more on the kind of setting the stage and a little bit of the tools that, that kind of fit into those categories but it's it um, yeah that's a that's a that's a tough branch and so I, I feel for you we just started early childhood sped program at where I teach but that's good what else who else is where are you coming from? So I'm an ITC as well at a middle school and our uh, self-contained classes are really not um, integrating our LMS canvas um, because of the current needs going on in that space. And so I'm hopeful to kind of bridge that gap a little bit yeah. and see how we can leverage what we currently have in place to yeah. assist them and make their workload a little bit easier yeah. um, and see what we also need in regards to technology um, to help simplify any of the accessibility needs or whatever they, yep. they may need. Yeah, and, and we'll be touching a little bit on UDL and some of that, and we'll touch briefly on assistive tech. Um, a lot of what we're talking about is more general curriculum and accommodation in meeting students' needs in the, in the general environment. However, uh, some of the stuff we're going into is adapted. I actually had, so I, I wrote up this presentation. I talked it through with my wife and she's like, cut that, cut that, cut that, cut that, cut that. And so I, there were like 10 extra slides in there. Some of it was on uh, adaptive environments, which is really my background was adaptive. And so I have a heart for it, but um, there are some pieces in here that we're gonna touch on that can be into adaptive and we think about adaptive too. So it's in there, but what else? Where else? I've been a division instructional coach yeah. uh, for the last four years. Yep. And most recently I went back into one school and I'm an administrator in one school. So kind of taking my background and putting it with an administrative lens and how are we really supporting all kids? That's very cool. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. So I'm an instructional technology coach and I teach at an elementary yep. and a um, middle school. Okay, so. that's fantastic. Now we know Nathan's over at High school. Technology coach, I work over the high school. Yeah, yeah. So very cool. Um, so yeah, my background was kind of in both. I uh, I am I wonder if most of you are younger, but does anybody recognize any of this up there? Maybe I should make this a little bit bigger. Does that look familiar to anybody? It reminds me of Monster Mac when I was like <laughs> five or six. I just yeah. remember playing that yeah. on MS DOS. <laughs> you would solve math problems, and the monster would get eaten. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is on the left hand side, the, the two blues. Oh, yeah, those two are uh, number munchers, math munchers, is, uh, and, ver and uh, word munchers is what it is. The top right, I'm sure some of you recognize it's Oregon Trail. Yeah. And then the bottom left is just Windows 95. I, I was looking for something that actually showed the PowerPoint back then. I just couldn't find the screenshot I wanted. Um, on the right hand side, the top right is an Apple IIe. And the bottom one is an uh, Intel 386 processor machine. Those things were built about 1985. So I was at the time I was teaching, it was about 1995 was when it was, and I started teaching in a special ed classroom. And they were in the process of replacing the old labs and some of the stuff that was going on. Teachers didn't have, at that point, had really a lot of computers in the classroom, but I was teaching children with intellectual disabilities in the mild category. So I was teaching social studies, practical social studies, practical mathematics, communication and vocational skills was my job. My partner was teaching the reading, writing, and math. I was reading, writing, and um, reading and writing and science. Sorry, science. So um, I started looking around, and everybody was giving away these computers, or trying to get rid of them, they were going to throw them away. I was hoarding them because I found that my students really could benefit pretty heavily from at least access to technology. And the assumption was, if there was a special ed class, they didn't really have the ability to work in computers and do things. 
but that's an, is a poor assumption because we're just talking about different levels is all we're talking about. And we're talking about different support needs. And so that's the way we need to start with this. For me, this journey began in 1995. And now 26 years later, I'm still kind of thinking about this and we're still struggling a little bit. When I do research on things and look for it, even looking at for this particular presentation, a couple months ago, I started doing to find out what people were saying about special ed and tech, not special ed and technology, because that really takes you to assistant tech, but special ed and instructional tech and ed tech. There's just some general things about VR being helpful for experiential, which is good. There's nothing wrong talking about that, but it wasn't there. Augmented reality, connecting stuff in through data, connecting to people's experiences. That's good, but that's not all the way there. We, we aren't to the point where we're talking about pedagogy. What we're talking about instead is what tool can match this really quickly with something that may be of interest or engagement, which is a good starting point, but it's not there. So this doesn't get us all the way there, this presentation, this discussion, but it's a, it's a starting point for me in some respects. Last year, we talked, I talked about um, kind of virtual environments and especially adapted in some of those environments where how can we get our special ed and special needs kids um, the help that they need during especially the pandemic because there was a crisis and how in the world can we get these kids online? Most of what we talked about in special ed was how can we do IEPs and IEP meetings and things like that. But we needed to move to how can we meet student needs? The last thing I'll say at an introductory level is my son has a dyslexia and attention deficit. My daughter actually is gifted, but she also has attention deficit. And so I'm on both ends. And my son is probably gonna go become a welder. That's what he wants to do, he's not going to college. My daughter is probably going on to get her doctorate and something. And so I've, I've seen both ends of the spectrum here. So it's not really just about special ed, it's about the variance of learning in these technology and rich environments, what can we do about that? So I welcome your feedback and your conversation and your arguments and your anger. Any of that stuff is fine with me because I think it's better to have a conversation about this than just the presentation stuff. So the, the big agenda is uh, the two thirds, probably a little bit over two thirds of the first two bullets. And I'm not offended if you go, oh, okay, I'm done. <laughs> this is not what I wanted. And I totally get that, but you can still, you can get the presentation from this 2021 as a tiny URL at the bottom. So feel free to grab that if you want. And you also can drop me an email, which is at the end of that presentation. And I'm glad to talk with you if you want to say it to someone else. But um, setting the stage for special ed and ed tech and thinking about kind of the big issues there, we're using uh, ISTE standards as a discussion on the ed tech side. And we're looking for what special ed is requiring of us. The second bit is kind of building principles. So we're kind of kind of analyzing and synthesizing is what we're doing. And we're going to kind of talk through it. And these are just Randy Dunn's arguments for us. And again, this is an opening salvo of a conversation less than actually having some sort of decent um, presentation. It's already built in something. And the third is um, kind of looking at some practical examples to just kind of align a little bit with what the principles that we've arrived at. Those are kind of, that's the direction we're going. The last presentation I did on this, we didn't have as many challenges as starting as this one did, just because we had the, the virtual side, uh, but that still went over and the last 10 minutes was just that last bit, that last bullet. So it was, it was a little bit of a world. So it depends on how much we yammer, which I'm guilty of talking too much, as some of you may know. Um, so setting the stage, this, I have a special ed background in tech, I already mentioned that, so that's bullet point one, but bullet point two, there's a lot of ITRT, CRT, that sort of folks in here, and that's fantastic. I mean, that's that's wonderful. If you haven't had it's, um, deep exposure to special ed, you may realize that there's broad categories of special ed like so up there, the adaptive in general, but you may not have a, a deeper understanding of why they are the way they are. I actually had a slide that my wife recommended I remove. I can always send that back to you all later if you ever want to see it. But, but on it, it really looked at the difference between general and adaptive. And I don't want to make this all about special ed primer for, for technology resource, because you, you can get that at your schools and you've probably been exposed at some level to that. But the idea is the general curriculum is as well aligned. It's students in inclusion environments. It's students who are primarily needing accommodation. The 504 refers to the Rehab Act. And there's a piece of the 504 that basically says that if you're in a publicly funded environment, then you need to have access to those services for us as education. When I was in college, I got a physical disability. Um, when I was in college, I got pulled into the 504 world briefly. I got early access to, to scheduling. It's fantastic. It's when it was scheduled like right after the football games, which was beautiful at James Madison. So I registered for classes and I was able to come up with just this dream schedule. But then I felt guilty the next semester. I dropped out of the 504 program and I was the last dude on campus ever since then to you know, schedule. But 504 is really about access. For me, the assumption was 
It's true now, but back then it wasn't true. Um, but it's it would be more difficult for me to make the journey between classes, so I need more time to register to make sure I get the right classes. That's the idea. So it's not really what's happening in the class. It's not the learning. It's about access. So that's why 504, which many of you already know, but the 504 plans are accommodation lists for students. That's what they really are. And they meet those particular needs. So again, we're talking about accommodations differentiation here broadly, but it's it's gonna touch on special ed, but it's more of a, how can we think about this a pedagogical approach with ed tech that also meets special ed? That's really the question. Uh, we emphasize accommodations, as mentioned. Uh, oh, and I should say the adaptive curriculum is more of the practical skills for later. Uh, the, the way it works is the X, Y axis, if you can imagine. And these are like, the academic, go, further academic going up over time on the X, the academic drops as the kid gets older, the academic emphasis, and there's an increase in practical skills. Because we're basically training a child in an adaptive world in order to be as independent as they possibly can later in life. It's all about practical skills. So I'm about vocational, community living, daily living skills, and even post-secondary plans. Like, what are they going to learn? Are they going to take a ballroom dancing class with their wife or husband later on in life? How would they enroll in such things? That's where it is. Uh, so adapted is all about aligned standards here in Virginia, ASLs. It's about not standard curriculum. They're not in biology and English 11. And they often are in self-contained environments rather than inclusion and mainstreamed environments with we used to say. The, the third bullet going down are some of the things that we are, are the primary challenges. So I, again, I'm spending more time on general than I am on the other side, the adapted, but the adapted is going to play into this because I think when we look at children individually, which is what we should do, some of them have strengths, even if they are an SLD, specific learning disability, they have strengths that other kids don't have, and they have weaknesses that other kids do have, and you know, so, so forth. So it's it's difficult to just put people into simple room or categories and envelopes. We don't want to do that. We want to meet children's needs. So many of the children, though, in specific learning disabilities have processing challenges. My son, dyslexic, he has a processing challenge. You listen to the dude read, he reads like a champ because he's got incredibly strong phonemic awareness and that particular analysis skills. He was taught the right way to read. He can do that, but he can fool you. So his teachers used to argue with me all the time, say, he doesn't have dyslexia. He doesn't have it. Like, dude, I got the data to show he does. I'm telling you, he does. No, he doesn't have dyslexia. Um, over time, that they accepted the fact he does have dyslexia because of the way he processes information. And a lot of specific learning disabilities, the challenge is processing. It's auditory, it's visual, it's how they're taking in any information in any way, dealing with that information. That also is impacted by speed. And so if we're talking about multi-input, and we're also talking about how fast they can input, I'm a fast talker. If you had processing challenges, you may be reeling right now and you're going, holy moly, he's going too fast. That's a question we need to deal with. Um, and the third one is self-advocacy in that line. So we're not, it's the famous, you know, teach a, teach a, you know, give a kid a fish, you can eat for a day, teach a kid a fish, you can, you can eat for a lifetime, slightly paraphrased. It's that kind of idea. When we're, when we're working with kids in special ed, we're training them to be as independent as they possibly can be. Just like every other kid in our class. It's just, in that case, in special ed, we're being more explicit about community living, daily living, and that sort of thing, especially in the adaptive. So we want the kid to be self-initiated, autonomous, and because there's certain exercise self-advocacy, especially in decision. These were all decent goals for us. All right, please feel free to um, jump in. Um, so what we're not talking about is system tech, but we're gonna send this in a second one. Just, and I have nothing against the system tech, it's fantastic, but it serves its purpose. And here's the definition. This is from IDEA 2004, which, History second. Um, the original law came out in 1975. It was the Education of All Handicapped Children Act. And then after that, we uh, we had reauthorizations to that law from 75 on, and we had IDEA 2004. So it's any item, piece of equipment, product system, acquired commercially off the shelf, modified, customized, that is used to, and here's the important part increase, maintain, or improve functional capabilities of the child with a disability. Um, exception the term does not include medical devices. That's not included. But that middle part is really important. Increase, maintain, or improve functional capabilities. So it's really about access to the environment, the learning environment, and whatever's contained within the environment. So these are the kinds of things that you see in assistive tech. So on the left, bottom left side there, that's a Dynavox. Dynavox is all about taking digital choice input and expressing it on your behalf. 
Stephen Hawking is an example of this. Um, he before he passed away, he had something that spoke on his behalf. He made choices with eye movement and finger is what he had, and he was able to do that. So that's an example of Dynavox. The new invention, relatively new in the last 15 years, of this iPhone completely overturned everything we thought about with communication, alternative communication. This, nobody ever thought that cell phones would become the primary driver of how children with fewer nonverbal autism and spectrum can actually communicate the world around. Now they can use a cell phone and don't have to carry something around. Uh, my physical disability is such that my arm, my right arm doesn't go any further than this without throwing it. And so I cannot button my top button on my shirt. So my mom in the mid eighties, I was born in 71, got me a button hook like the dude with the white shirt there. You string it through, grab the button, pull it back. And then you button your shirt is what you do. That is, um, these are literally assistive tech. That's what these are, but they are function oriented, they're function and replacement. Scan marker error, this is, you go over top of text, it reads it and it tells you back what it, what it said. The, the little boy at the computer, he's got a kind of a ballish thing that he's putting on top of a piece of paper and it's a magnifier. Is where the, so it's accessing content. That's classic in assistive uh, tech lab. Bottom up with a pencil, larger grip, that's simple assistive tech. Uh, bottom right, mobility. Does anybody recognize the one on the right hand side, the newspaper connections one? Usually can. It's can't. A, it's a, what it is, is, is part of the Kurzweil reading. Uh, software is what it is. So it's kind of along those lines. You highlight and it tells you, you can also make adjustments and those sorts of things. So it leads you through it. So this is the world of assistive tech, which is mostly about replacing or supporting a function. That's it. It is not about what we talk about in that tech. There's nothing in ISTU standards about replacing function. That's not what it does there. UDL is another part of our world. If you don't know UDL well, this is probably the starting point for this entire conversation because UDL can cover both the, the special ed side and the ed tech side pretty easily. In fact, it does. It's to connect you. In special ed, we talk about UDL all the time. In ed tech, we talk about UDL all the time. So this is the common language for us. On the left-hand side, um, sustaining effort of persistence, these kinds of things are really trying to push students into self-ownership and management of their own learning. That's where we want students to be. UDL is the instructor for both the ed tech side where we want students to open it, which is what we see in the ISTE standards, but it also is good for our special ed students because we're teaching them how to fish rather than just giving them fish. If we want a student to learn how to deal with the transportation system in their locality, you don't show them how to take the blue number 23 bus two stops to stop. You show them how to read a bus schedule, deal with whatever decision making they need to with the buses, however much it costs that year, and then how to deal with social engagement on that bus itself. That's how you get them through the process. So it's really about teaching uh, autonomy and self-ownership. And that also uh, caters into learning as well. So I'm not spending a whole bunch of time at UDL, but we, the session that I led on this right before this, it became a pretty big conversation. And it's because it's, um, it's really instrumental in this entire kind of consideration. So go back to it. So I'm gonna take a few minutes on the ISTE standards. Uh, I have basically extracted the pieces that I wanted to kind of highlight. There are the other ones are extremely important. I, I drink the Kool-Aid on ISTE standards. Learners, fantastic. Leaders, leaders, fantastic. It makes sense to me. The, the digital citizenship, the citizen part is very important. And so is the co collaborator communication side. All of those things are really important, but those make up who I am as a professional educator. That's like the, the approach to being in the profession of education. The, the ISTE standards here, these three, the design, facilitate, and analyze, those three are the process of education. This is the process of teaching. If you, if you could do these three things with those other kind of dimensions of educational profession, then that really helps you. So, so we'll take a second on this. I've focused on designer, facilitator, and analyst. So the designer side, I've highlighted the words that I think are really important for our conversation here. Design authentic, learner-driven, and accommodate learner variability. Those are the three things. Now, learner variability, accommodation, that is special ed language, straight out. That makes sense. So make it a little bit of an argument. But the other two are extremely important. We want to create authentic experiences for the students. They are going to tap into their knowledge easier when it's real life for them. Things that are in the abstract is difficult, especially for somebody who has to work hard to process the information. The more you can make it easier about, oh, that makes sense for this, the easier it's going to be for them. 
So authentic is important and learner driven and learner centric is really important. Special ed, we often feel like we have to take the reins of the student's learning. The more we can get that kid to work individually, the more um, the kid will be prepared for life. The facilitation side, we want to support student achievement in all areas, not just on the AC standards uh, for students, but in all areas. And the third one is this kind of analysis point, which is using data to make decisions about instruction. And that just makes sense. So what kind of ways can we gather data on our students to make decent decisions? On the ISU standards for students, there are four pieces I extracted out. Again, there's nothing wrong with the others. These are just the four that we want to pull. The first one is the empowered part. We want to leverage tech to take, uh, get the student to take an active role. This is choice, achievement, how they are proceeding with their own learning. So my son, I try to push as much as I can as a dad. This is what I try to do as a dad. To push as much as I can and say, Graham, what's the best way for you to study for a test? What's the best way for you to attack a project? Even my daughter, I say, you have to write a paper for this advanced history class you're taking. What is the first step for you and why? And now what do you have to figure out with that? So these, these questions are not necessarily just for our general learners, they're for all. So what can we do to get them to start making choices about technology in order to accomplish tasks that meets their particular unique needs? That is, there's nothing wrong with that in the world of special ed either. The knowledge construction stuff, we talk about curating, constructing, producing, and making meaningful learning experiences. This is all ownership, all of it. All of it is about managing your own learning spaces, your own learning direction. If that's what that is about. The innovative designer, we're identifying solving problems. Problem-based learning is not just for gifted kids. It's not just even for general kids. And the last is the creative communicator. We communicate clearly and express ourselves creatively or the students express themselves creatively. And so we wanna make sure they have an opportunity to, to speak in different ways to demonstrate knowledge. And we also wanna provide clarity. And I would shift this a little bit to say, the more we can provide clarity as teachers for our students, the more likely they are to be able to, to be successful in those tasks. So feel free to jump down where it's all good, it's for you. So the themes that we kind of come to are these. Number one is we want to focus heavily on authentic learning. That's important from the student side and from the teacher side. How we design and how the students uh, re react to and absorb content and learning. The second is data-driven. Um, this is really that part of the analyst for the educator side. So how can we make decisions based upon what data we collect? But that data stuff is really interesting. It's not just about the multiple choice true false test that has 20 questions and how many to get right quantifiably rate the child. It's about what are we collecting on the kid that represents truly deep learning for that kid. The data driven there becomes, I have made decisions about um, what I believe is important that the kid produced that then makes a, a change in how I, I proceed or how I correct. Then there's personalization and individualized learning. This is where we start getting the personalized learning environments. And PLEs are, it's a kind of a buzzword. And it's usually what it is, is, all right, kid, here's like five portal sites that you could use to manage your own stuff. Now, good luck to you. But if we're a little bit more systematic in the way we think about it, how can we best meet a kid's needs? Like, what is it that's their biggest challenge? Is it that there's too much in front of them? Well, if you give them a portal, there's too many choices to make, and that's problematic. But how can they create a system that's not just a portal, but a collection of resources that are either digitally based or human based, real life, that can then help that kid? kind of move forward. That's the personalized learning environment. But individualized and personalized learning, learning, we want to move towards student ownership. That is not out of the reach of special ed, even for our adaptive kids. We want them to all have that. And the last one is engagement. And we want to do things interesting and engage in specific ways. That's kind of a UDL approach as well, as we think about how we can engage. Are you all familiar with cognitive load? Have you ever heard this before? So, um, Cognitive load is really about how much verbal content or how much, how much you can process at any given time for specific kinds of tasks. I had a much more complex slide uh, up here. I'm glad to send it out to you if you want to look at it later. Uh, but cognitive load is one of those things I think is good. It's a processing thing. So it's something you should probably pull into your consideration of thinking about. But the way cognitive load is like, it works like this. I, I use the analogy of the, of the jar of marbles. Let's say you had 100 marbles in a jar. And I'm talking to you right now. And so Nathan is listening to what I'm saying. And if he's listening to me and his, then that's gonna cost him 60 marbles. 
he pulls that out of his jar. There's only 40 left. Now, if I mean, he's over there typing, I think he's taking notes, but if, you know, I'm not calling him out. But if, if Nathan is over there and he's like texting with his buddy or something like that, then at that point, he's doing a second verbal test that also requires 60. They only have 40 to share. And so I tell my undergrads all the time that they've been lied to that they can multitask. They can't. What they can do is they can rapidly deploy their attention, redeploy it um, over and over again. So if you are reading an eBay review of some, some item or something, and I guess Amazon review would be better, Amazon review of some item, at the same time as trying to listen to me, you're going to catch only part of what I'm saying every time you deploy your attention because it's that way. I find that the biggest culprits in this are churches when they create like videos for uh, promoting a ministry or something. I, I was sitting in my church, which I love. Um, and I watched this video of like a hundred year old schoolhouse with beautiful panning shots with sunlight coming in and all this stuff it was really nice, but had zero to do with the content of the video. I can tell you about the visuals. To this day, I can't tell you what that video is about. It's a, it's a classic case of, of that. I paid attention to the, 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 cause it was communicating ideas to me. I was thinking, oh, it's a new hundred year old schoolhouse. Well, it looks like it's in a farming community. That's kind of interesting. I wonder what that, I mean, so all of that content had nothing to do with the actual content or the purpose of the entire video. So cognitive load has to do with how we perceive, perceive information in any context. Cognitive load is used to talk about even how we um, absorb content on a web page, And that's what it's like. As applied to school, it's, how we present content and make choices for content for our students and then how they receive that content and how they're able to perceive and process that content. So if we have tasks that are verbally competitive, one of them is gonna win. That's just the way it's gonna be. We cannot split our attention between verbal tasks. I have this young a female friend of mine who she works at our church and she, she uh, is, stands up while she's working at her desk. She has like a raised desk and she's typing and answering the phone at the same time she's doing a stair climb the whole time. And so she's sitting there like doing this all day long. It's impressive. And so she's sitting there doing it. And the question would be, how in the world can that happen with cognitive load? Motor memory, verbal memory, and verbal content and verbal processing. Two different tasks which have nothing to do with each other. The, the, the big lesson in cognitive load, that, that, and I'll leave it with this, is that there's something called, um, uh, there's the extraneous, there's the internal, and then there's what you name. The internal cognitive load is really what's the intrinsic part is what's already contained within the task. I have to learn these five things, done. That's a level of complexity I probably can't control. I can maybe split it up over a couple of things, but I still, it's there. But when it comes to extraneous, we're talking about how we do it and, and what other information we choose to give you. The germane stuff um, is really about how they connect it with what they already know. And that's the Piaget world. So I learned something new, goes through my filter. The filter says it goes here because I kind of recognize that and so I'm gonna store it here and then it becomes deeper learning as a result. So the lessons will come out of this is one, we need to make sure we're careful about what our students are learning and keep them focused. And two, that we want to give them real life experience as much as possible so that they know where to store it and what to do with that. And that helps not only with our special ed, but our slow learners who are often neglected, our general learners and our gifted kids who often get bored. So all these things kind of can benefit. You were saying about cognitive load, you know, it's like how we can approach that with how we teach things, but you were also saying like a person has its own cognitive load as well. Like the thing, like if I was if I was doing something, I couldn't focus as much with you. Yeah. So could it also be argued that some students may come in with a less, like people are thinking about that marbles, they have less marbles by default because they don't have, like I think of students like with ADHD, like by default, even the smallest thing may take that cognitive load away. So that's they're, true. They're kind of, the exceptionality. So yeah, it may be reducing the environment and trying to help the student have a focused environment for that as well. Yeah, even reducing it, recognizing mm -hmm. that some of them don't even have enough marbles. Even. I, I love iPads, but sometimes I, I mean, iPads for me are dangerous. I'm attention deficit. As soon as I start reading something, I'm like, oh yeah, I should go check this out. I mean, like everything is at my fingertips. Maybe some of you are much more disciplined than I am, but um, that's, that's something else in the planning process. How can I create a learning environment that is focused for the students so that they have less opportunity possibly to exercise cognitive work for something that's unrelated. That's a fair, that's a very good point. Okay, we're cool. All right, so guiding principles, we're, we're kind of getting close to our end point, um, I think. So these are the things we wanna do. We wanna engage students. We've already kind of mentioned that. We beat that horse a little bit, but we wanna do it on prior knowledge and real life experience as much as possible. That's really important for us. The second is we want to have multimedia stuff. We want to engage them through multimedia choices. 
Um, and what I love about the video side, and this is this is a little bit of a topic because I probably all I think all of you have, or most of you have a, a kind of tip, technology resource background. Um, it's getting people to adopt the use of small focus videos in a library is difficult because it's one more thing to manage, you know. But it's still something there for references. My uh, my daughter, attention deficit as she is, she's she's got the ability to function well in class, but she forgets especially about referencing. For her history class, she has to do Chicago style um, citation approach. And she wise about that. I say, well, it's easy to better than APA, APA is too but, but uh, Chicago is you know, reasonably straightforward, but she still forgets. So every time she writes a paper, she has to go back and watch a three minute video that's an intro to, to Chicago style. It's just a three minute thing. I tell my students, I don't care if they record me all the time. If they really have a desperate need to watch me a second time, I, I find that impressive. You know? But it also gives them the ability to rewind me and go back and listen. So sometimes these videos can be really powerful ways to do it. Also, they can be used for creation of projects. Multiple tools for students to self-manage and autonomy. We can beat that dead horse. And the last one is focus on new skills learning, removing extraneous information, which is close to Nathan's point. So we have we have this kind of kind of framework for thinking about how we're engaging students in the ed tech world based upon what ACE standards say, but also what is needed from our special education folks at the same time. Again, I'm talking about a wide range of individuals from high level, even twice exceptional students, gifted and learn disabled or gifted and on the spectrum, all the way down to nonverbal and low cognitive function. So it's a pretty wide world to talk about. So here are some of the tools. Now I'm just gonna kind of fly through these for just a few minutes. My goal was to finish about quarter till. I think I'm gonna hit that. If you have any uh, questions or so forth, feel free, or afterwards we can have individual conversations if you'd like. And I also have my email up there um, later on, which you're welcome to pick me up. So the first one is, uh, I really like the idea of, of the um, kind of the, the hyperdocs approach. I was a big fan and have been for a long time of the web quest, because, because I mean, I know they're out of style now, but they're usually, if they're done well, they're systematic. It's like, do this, focus on this, think about this, submit this, you know, it's, it's, it's instructional guidance. In the world of special ed, because of Ledvigotsky, we talk about um, scaffolding approaches. So you have, a, you have a, a task and the kid is weak in these couple areas. So I'm gonna build up a support for the kid in that area. And I'm gonna get him there. It's not an accommodation. It's because you're not accommodating. What you're doing is you're adjusting and taking care of that until the kid can become independent on that particular task. Sometimes our kids in special ed will be cognitively and even general processing wise on the same level as their students, their fellow students with regard to the overall content. But when it comes to certain kinds of tasks, there'll be weaknesses. And then we have to figure out how we can scaffold and support there until the kid can become independent. So this kind of work is really kind of interesting because it can be as open as you want it to be or it can be as close. And I know hyperdocs are just like elementary in the world of this time. You know, this is just like basic work. But that said, it's pretty good. Adobe Spark is another example. I'm, I'm a big fan of Google Docs. I'm being recorded, I think, so this is always dangerous, but it always goes through the back of my mind, how much is Google collecting money? You know, what are they gonna use to sell me something later? And so that always goes in the background, but, but ultimately the set of tools there are pretty good. Now I know schools are using them, you know, I think Bedford County does where, where you teach and others probably do too. Um, and so there's more of a protection there to some extent, but we still have to ask questions about what's being used and, and certainly for considerations. So this is, this is the first kind of step is to think about how we can have a directed focused work. Here's your link, here's your task, here's your question, go take care of the business. It's not simple as in fill in the blank. It's more of a, here's exactly what I want you to do next. I actually happen to be a fan of Nearpod. Um, not everybody is, but I am, mostly because I can be directed with it. I can control it. Okay. Watch this video. You're watching your small group. You're all listening to your pods. Great. Now you're going to answer this question, or you can draw this, or you can answer this in this way, or whatever it might be. So your pod can be very controlling. Another one is the student ownership and organizational stuff. This one is, um, I have the two images up here. The top one is, I'm sure you've seen these before, it's Microsoft OneNote, which is more about folder structure and organization. As an ADD guy, when I look at OneNote, when I looked at it the first time, it overwhelmed me. Does anybody use OneNote or Evernote personally? How, how do y'all do y'all manage anything digitally, like in organizational sorts of way, using any tools that actually work? I use Q sometimes, and I'm like Keep. Google Key, but we're, we're mainly Google, so we just use. You look cool tools. Into that, that, that yeah. Thing. yeah. 
I've seen Keep before. I've never played it. Before. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's best for like like sticky notes because yeah. as ADD myself, I need those kind of things. But so, so it's more to like save everything. Though. So it's project dependent centric. Yeah. 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 There's there's no easy answer to this. But when we go to the PLEs thing again, that can be such a buzzword, personalized learning environments. And what we the danger is we just say, here's your one note. Now go go to town. Because like I don't even know what to do with this. Because it's how you organize in digital is really based upon how you would organize, period. And then it kind of it filters, you know, it kind of goes out into the digital world. It's not like the digital world is going to change everything for you. It may give you opportunity that you didn't have before, but ultimately you want to you want to help the student develop their method of works. My daughter has to use um, notability, which is the bottom left for her class. She's very artistic and very verbal. So for her, if you look at her notability notebook, there's no folder. Everything is out, and there's no naming convention. <laughs> so like, where's the, there's 108 documents in there. Like, well, how can you find it? She goes, I just kind of eyeball it until I find my thing. So I have to work with her. I've got some work to do with my daughter. But by and large, the kids should be developing a system that works for them. I think the danger of PLEs is what we said earlier, which is here's your portal. Good luck. You know, this is what you now need to use. I think we need to be thinking about how we can help our gifted, our general, our slow learners, and our special needs learners, our exceptional learners, how we can help them develop systems that work for them individually for their personalized learning environment, their individualized learning environment. So it's about self-management, student ownership, and things like that. I mentioned Evernote in there too, because that's relatively free. Project-based learning, I don't have to spend any time on this because this is y'all's thing. I mean, I'm, PBL is like the world for, uh, for, for us. But right-hand side, kids kind of designing something. Left-hand side, my daughter goes to that school. This is from two years ago. They won a robotics competition. And that's from Chatham Hall, which is in Chatham, Virginia, just south of Lynchburg, about an hour and a half from here or something like that. Um, and she, my daughter is in the robotics club now, uh, which is kind of interesting. They have a competition in January, and she, she actually came up, this is unrelated. She came home one day and she said, I looked around, and it was so cool because it was all girls going to the robot. You know, it was like, it was that kind of thing. It was like STEM in action for female STEM. And so they, they're having a good time. But my daughter is a verbal person, highly verbal, highly creative, highly, highly artistic, not science, not tech. So for her, she's watching stuff go. And, and so she had to find her task, which is journaling, drawing the designs and things like that. That's where her world ended up. Regardless, PBL is another opportunity. Now, the reason I brought this up is because in ed tech, we think about PBL all the time, but we don't think about PBL and special ed. We should be thinking about PBL and special ed. And so the same principles for PBL, for project and problem-based, should be a driving force in special ed. We have to solve this problem in our community. How are we going to do that thing? Because these kids are going to have to solve problems when they get out in the real world, too, at varying levels of complexity, but they're still there. So the process of thinking about a problem and solving it is not unique to ed tech. It is just pedagogy. It's how do you get your kids engaged in learning and making decisions? That's all it is. So I just, that's just a moment. Uh, this one's where we get into video libraries for just a, a few minutes. So uh, this is from a high school, it's Kingsbury High School. I just grabbed it. And it shows you this kind of organization of content they have. The bottom right is how to cite a website. And it's just a little three minute video. It's not actually a video up there. It's just one that is there. But the video libraries can be really powerful. But let's make sure we, we widen this. There's video libraries that are created by teachers for your students. There's video libraries that are created by teachers to share with other teachers when something comes up. Maybe the English person is really good for references and that sort of thing. And so the references are there. The, the, um, and then the history person, you know, starts using Randy Dunn, borrows your, your stuff and uses it in his class. So suddenly we start using it with each other. And it's also for students creating content for whether it's for others or whatever it may be. There is no excuse anymore for not creating videos. There may be an excuse for how you integrate it into your school. That's hard. The part about creating it's different. In the mid 90s, I used to work with an at risk group of boys in our school. These were the high dropout rate ones. And we went spelunking and caving and, and we went uh, to ropes courses. We recorded it and I had to create a video. It took me three days to create a five minute video because I had to take all the footage. I used a VCR connector, put it into an iMac, and I just went there and I had to, to edit the video and do all this stuff and you had to push it back out the VCR tapes. I mean, it's just complicated. Fast forward 20 some years, 
Now I can record you right now. I can push it up to YouTube or someplace in the next three minutes and we can have an instructional video created. So there's really no good excuse anymore for such things. So the video content's there. We just have to figure out as a system how we can share resources with each other, either that we created or even our students created. There's also I'm engaging stuff like Khan Academy. I'm not spending any time on this. You know about it. But the free resources Khan has offered is fantastic. Um, it's there. The third one, though, on this one is talking about social stories. Now, this is going into the adaptive world. And so these can be created by students um, to talk about their own social stories and exploring, analyzing, and self-analyzing. There's a lot of research on kids on the spectrum who create videos who then go back and look at their, their work. Like, how did I engage somebody properly? Did I do eye contact? Did I smile? Did I say something nice to them? Did I shake their hand firmly? I mean, these are the social process that we have to follow. So the tech world that we use to, say, create video content in order to meet this need, it fits there, too. You can create video content and communicate ideas. In the case of this, I'm going to show you this very quickly because most people don't know about social stories. This is, um, I'm going to fast forward. Here we are. Using, it says, using friendly words, social story. It's, you can almost hear the sound, probably people online here, but it doesn't matter. He's basically talking, he's like giving a narration of these kids talking to each other as cartoons about how they may or may not be interacting positively. And he's telling this as a narrator over top of it. This is a simple version of a social story is using animation. Social stories can be literally Nathan and I go grabbing a, a something go standing outside and then filming a conversation that happens between us that can then be used as instructional content. But also, if I was a special ed student, obviously I can go out with a teacher and then record the good and the bad way of doing social interaction. So that's part of it. This is really powerful with the more, um, um, the kids in the, in the spectrum, but it also can be used um, for even for our general education kids when we talk about bullying and some of that stuff. I won't play this video because we're running low on time. This is a couple of my students from several years ago. It's public on YouTube, so I don't feel bad about showing it, <laughs> but, um, but as Catherine is in the front, and. Uh, Catherine and her buddies developed a, it was called a task analysis and say step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, for how you go through a particular task to break it down to smaller social pieces. In this case, it's she's making decisions about who she should hug around campus is what she's doing. So she looks at, she goes, she starts going through the analytical process. I wonder if I should um, hug this person. Well, do I know them well? Yes. Is it the type of person that fits in this category that's okay to hug? Yes. Then I can hug that person. So again, creating video content as a teacher or as a student in order to be able to communicate ideas and for analysis and for discussion is part of the process that could be in the special ed world. It's certainly more engaging. And what, if you do it right as a teacher, you're basically creating a library. And so three years down the road, little Johnny has trouble making friends and knowing who to hug. Well, I've got a video series that we developed on that. And now we can use that. So that actually looks like that. A couple more slides in this. Oops. Flipgrid. Sometimes we take tech and we throw it at, at teachers and say, good luck. And Flipgrid is one of those ones that sometimes gets done that way. Flipgrid's great. Everybody take Flipgrid. Now I'll see you next week. Make sure you're using Flipgrid. And that's the way we start thinking about it. And you as the TR, you know, CTRT folks and those types, you know that um, what's required of you to try to keep these, these teachers up to scratch. And it's a little bit difficult to do, but Flipgrid is still a very good one, especially when we're creating content and interacting with students. And that could be good. I would say that's a good one for the online world. Another one for the online, for especially more severe disabilities, is just using video content and setting up tasks. On the right-hand side is Glockster. I'm a big fan of it, even though it's a little cheesy and a little, a little older. But Glockster is multimedia poster, if you've ever seen that before. And it allows you to put audio, video, pictures, and words all together and create these multimedia posters. If, if a student is required to do a task and they have difficulty figuring out where to start, or especially if they have a problem with the writing aspect of it, then giving them choice, this is autonomy, this is pushing towards that. If you're giving them choice, like in Blobster, they can actually put together the four important things and two things that people did that would reflect the same type of thing if they actually wrote a text, um, like a text of some sort to demonstrate. So Gloucester is another example of that. So we're talking about alternative assessment techniques and approaches. This is extremely hard on the teachers though, because they have to figure out how do I assess something that could be a paper, it could be a video, it could be a ribbon dance, or it could be a blog story. I have no idea what it's going to end up being, right? And so this can be a little harder. Um, I'm not spending any time on this, just take a second, but 
this, uh, if we want kids to, to exercise good digital citizenship skills, we have to teach them how to do it. That's it, you know, and that's stuff that y'all all know and you all agree with, I'm sure. But this is not just for our special ed kids, this is for all of them. We want to teach them how to interact in this world. So that's an example. Has anybody ever used Moat before? I thought this was pretty cool. Moat is a audio-based and it's basic, and Canvas has this capability too. If you have a Canvas environment for learning management, um, Canvas does this, but it allows you to create simple audio feedback notes. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was talking to a dude, we almost did a research study on it, kicking myself because we couldn't come up with Moat before Moat came up with it. And we were thinking about doing research on it, but he came up and he's like, I wanna really look at how well um, students will learn and improve, especially in mastery learning approaches by hearing audio feedback instead of just reading text. And that would have been an easy research study for us to do, we just never did it. Uh, but that's essentially what it is. I think hearing my inflection in my voice and saying, this is what's really important. This you didn't have to worry about. Your second paragraph, there's a problem here. Oh, you look over here. This is, and so being able to talk it through is better than just a student reading. And I found that to be true with my undergrads. I'm sure there's something there, but that's what Moat does. It's pretty good for assessment. So where did we come from? Well, we tried to establish the needs of special ed and how we looked at it. We looked at ISTE guidelines and then we basically tried to come up with ways that there's an overlap. I think to kind of summarize the statement, I think UDL is the hinge on this. I think that's where it is. And I think there's a lot more work to be done and maybe I'm wanting to do is to try to help do that. And I welcome anybody else. So at some point, if you want to drop me a note and say, dude, I'd love to explore this a little bit more. I'm happy to do that with anybody, the virtual folks in addition to you here. If there's anything I can do to kind of do that. I've thought about writing a little bit on this just because again, what I see on special ed and ed tech is pretty sparse. It, it's only on the assistive tech side. And so if there's, if there's anybody who's interested in that topic and wants to do it, especially from a practitioner point of view, I would love to, to collaborate. So let me know what I can do. So I finished with 10 minutes to spare and any questions, comments, otherwise you can slip out and I'll do that. Okay, thumbs up, I saw.